Jetzt freue ich mich sehr, euch jemanden anzukündigen, ähm, der, den ihr oder die ihr, wäre die richtige Formulierung, äh, seit gestern schon als Fragende erlebt hat. Da habt ihr sich, sie seid gestern hier und sie hat sich immer wieder äh, in den Diskurs eingemischt und ich freue mich jetzt sehr, sie in Person gleich zu erleben zum Thema Opportunity or Risk for Students with Disabilities. There was a question yesterday to this topic um, and we all know that AI edtech may bring many opportunities uh, to adapt higher education to the needs of its learners, but does that automatically mean that people of disabilities uh, have the choice, use their cho chances? So, so we will deep dive now um, because AI can also entail biases against people with disabilities and exclude them from the game. So we will discuss now uh, with Orian the opportunities and the risks of AI edtech for students with disabilities. Um, she's a research assistant and PhD candidate. Her na full name is Oriane Pires. She has been working at the Zurich University of Applied Science for two years on two projects to make Swiss universities more accessible. In February last year, she started her PhD at the University of Zurich on the topic of AI ethics and disability. So we are amidst uh, uh, of the topic. Uh, we are very happy to have you here and we are totally keen on your questions. There you are, Oriane. Question in, in German, in English, whatever you like. Great. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. So now I would like to talk to you about um, whether I want to ask you whether AI educational technologies can foster or hinder inclusion for students with disabilities in higher education. Uh, before we move on, I would like just to give you a little structure about what we're going to uh, talk about. Um, first, I will um, just introduce some definition and remind you of the law. And then we will move on to, uh, to AI-based assistive technologies and uh, their potential and limits before we talk about discrimination risk that we identify by screening the literature. And finally, at the end, I will give you a small take home uh, message and uh, provide you some, with some first solutions on how to uh, ensure inclusivity in higher education with AI. Okay, so let's start with introduction. Uh, just to be clear, uh, when I talk about AI, I mean weak AI, not a super intelligent robot that can do everything, but really uh, applications using machine learning techniques um, to solve a task, hopefully better than human. Um, I also talk about uh, assistive technologies because they are different, um, they, they face different issues than general purpose uh, technologies. So assistive technologies are uh, technologies that are used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional cap capabilities of persons with disabilities. And, and as you will see, if, if it's about enabling uh, students, it's quite different than when you try to monitor them or evaluate them. Another definition I want us to be clear on is what disability is. What does it mean? Um, according to World Health Organization, uh, disability results from the interaction with, between individuals with a health condition, such as cerebral palsy, with personal and environmental factors, including negative attitudes, inaccessible transportation and public buildings, and limited social support. And what this means is that um, the barriers that students with disability face are not an individual problem, but a collective one. Um, for instance, if a university decides not to let a student with ADHD, for instance, to uh, use a computer for an exam, it doesn't mean the student cannot do it because of ADHD, but because they were not given uh, the fair chances to give back their knowledge. Um, I want also to remind you of uh, that it is a right, uh, there's a right to education for students with disabilities, both in international law, so you have the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that was adopted in 2006. Uh, Germany signed it quite quickly in 2007 and it entered into force in 2009. It's actually earlier than in Switzerland where they adopted it or it entered into force five years later. And uh, in that convention, there's clearly a right to say that they, have a fair, they should have a fair access to higher education. 
Um, there's also national law that also guarantees that kind of rights. In Germany, it's the Gesetz zur Gleichstellung behinderter Menschen. It was adopted in 2002, but it, was since, it has been since then uh, updated. And to promote inclusion, we are really moving from a one-size-fits-all approach towards more um, universal design for learning. That's a framework that recognizes that every student is different and we need to engage with them differently. And there are three principles for this. So first, um, you need to motivate students differently by, for instance, uh, letting students choose uh, how they want to learn at their own pace, for instance. Second, you need to represent information differently. So, for instance, with audio format, with video format, maybe with a um, project base, as we heard uh, earlier this morning, um, that's different ways of uh, interacting with students. And finally, you need to give students um, the opportunity to engage differently, to give their knowledge back differently. So, for instance, you can give students the opportunity to choose between an oral or a written exam. So to sum it up, you need an open mindset for inclusion. Uh, you need flexibility and personalization. And of course, you also need time to discuss adaptation. Um, and the hope is that AI could help us with this goal. Um, so let's talk about AI-based assistive technologies because this is a really good way to start, even though there are some limits. So, for instance, you have writing and reading tools. Um, for instance, they can help to ident identify spelling mistakes and make suggestions, such as with a tool like Grammarly. It can facilitate uh, reading. So, for instance, you have an uh, immersive reader that is an integrated tool uh, in Microsoft software that uh, enable to increase the size of the text, just see the text only and not something else that would distract you. It separates syllables, it changes color, and that's quite useful for people with ADHD or uh, dyslexia. And more recently, of course, ChatGPT was, uh, for instance, said for uh, students with dyslexia to facilitate um, summarizing content or also sim simplifying content. But as usual, um, technology is not a miracle. Uh, if you give, make it easier to produce text, it's also possible that, you know, you will think, oh, yeah, but now it's easy to write text, so they can do it. Um, but actually, those students might still prefer to uh, choose all assignments. You should not overload them with writing assignments. Maybe oral assignment is better for them. Um, so the key question is, or the key um, point here is actually to ask them what is still better for them. And also, ChatGPT is still new and experimental, so it's important to be aware that it sounds promising, and I'm quite hopeful myself. Um, but we still need to run some tests to see how far it can go and how good it is. Another example of AI-based um, assistive technologies are automatic captions. You can find them on Zoom, MS Teams, on YouTube, uh, even in PowerPoint. And it saves a lot of time to create captions compared to creating them manually. And you really go from zero accessibility to some accessibility for students, for instance, who are deaf. And um, it also helps focus. It's not just people with hearing impairment, but if you read and listen to someone, uh, you use these two senses, and it helps you concentrate and process information and focus. So that's very helpful for someone with, a, with ADHD. And it also facilitates taking notes. Again, technology is not a miracle. Um, it's... It's quite good, but accuracy is still limited. Uh, it still needs human correction. So if you're a non-native speaker, you can still listen to, to the video and say, okay, this no word was not correct, but I could hear it. If you have a hearing impairment, this might not be the case. That's why you still need to correct for it. And um, there's another issue is that usually speech-to-text uh, software um, have difficulties uh, transcribing atypical speech, which literally means that some people's voice will not be heard or at least transcribed. So that's also, there are some projects doing this. I know Google is working on this, uh, but that's still uh, an issue that we need to keep in mind. So I've been talking to you about assistive technologies and how it can help um, students with disabilities. 
But honestly, when I looked into the literature, when you talk about AI educational technologies, the, those, the assistive technologies are not necessarily the technologies that we talk about. We talk about maybe predicting if a student will need some help or uh, providing intelligent tutoring system that can recommend you some resources. And we find that there are uh, more issues on this. But before I continue and go into the details, I want to explain to you what, what is the issue with AI and disability and why we need to be careful. So the first thing is um, disability is a characteristic that is diverse, multiple, and evolutive. Diverse because, well, within the category of disability, you have lots of disability. You have visual, hearing impairments, you have cognitive impairments. And also, it's important to know that the same, one person, two person with the same visual impairment will not necessarily have the same barriers and the same uh, needs. And that's very important to remember because it will affect how you can uh, improve inclusion for them. Second, uh, disability is multiple because many students, many people with disabilities have more than one disability. And it's also evolutive. Evolutive because if you think about um, ADHD, for instance, uh, it can be that one day you can focus very well on a task and the other day you cannot, which doesn't mean that the person is faking it. It simply means this person has ADHD. And for AI, it's quite confusing because then this characteristic is actually changing and it's too diverse, it's too multiple, and that's why they are likely to be outlier. And on top of this, usually the characteristic is underrepresented in data sets. Uh, here on the slides you have a fictitious example. Please don't believe that uh, this is real, that there's a positive uh, relationship between participation, participation on online platform and final exam grade, but let's imagine there is. The grade goes from zero to 20, that the French system, 20 is the best, and um, you want to find out, you want to predict the final grade. So the AI, we looked at how much you participate on the online platform, for instance, how much you clicked on activities, because then you assume, well, if the person read the materials, then they learn, so they will get a good grade. And they managed to do that with, um, with the um, blue dots in the middle, where you have a muster a pattern, and you realize, okay, there's a positive relationship. But then you have outliers. Uh, on the slide, they are on a red triangle, and for instance, you have this one student who barely went on the online platform but still scored very well. AI will have difficulty managing to, under to predict something for this student because it's an outlier. But it could be because uh, the platform was inaccessible for a student with visual impairment, so they didn't use the platform, but it still scored well because they used an, an alternative way to learn. And that's why we think uh, AI could face difficulty with that kind of data. Um, when, so we looked into the literature to find out whether they talk about ethical concerns and students with disability in research, uh, and students with disability. Um, and so we found 57 articles that presented an AI application that assess, understood broadly, that assess students and inform, to inform information, uh, informed decision or t to take decisions. And what we found out first is that um, most, uh, most articles did not talk about ethical concerns at all. And when they did, they talked about privacy. And privacy was understood very loosely. If they just mentioned that um, they anonymized their data, we counted it as privacy. Because it at least suggests that they know about privacy concerns and they accounted for it. And very fewer um, talked about bias and transparency, even though it's actually well-known issues in AI uh, ethics. Um, another concern is that um, Bell Almost nobody talked about uh, students with disabilities, only three out of 57 articles. Uh, this might be because um, usually the papers focused, had a technical perspective and forgot about didactics, but it's quite problematic because we know if we do not uh, account, if we do not test for students with disabilities, they are likely not to um, 
be considered and they are likely to have the issues that I mentioned before with AI. Um, so we identified several risks in the use of AI uh, educational technologies for students with disabilities. I want to emphasize that we actually have more risks, but I summarize so that it doesn't last too long. Um, the first thing is it's quite common, but the choice of data. We need to be careful about does this type of data could correlate with disability somehow or be, have, have an impact for them. And uh, here I come back to the uh, example of interaction log data. Usually it's quite um, exciting to be able to use them because you think, well, it focuses more on the behavior and not so much about who you are, what your characteristic is. But as I said, if the platform is not accessible, then interaction data, uh, interaction log data is likely to be different if you have a disability. And it could be that the intelligent uh, tutoring system does not work for you. Um, the second thing is that um, sometimes um, AI will rely on simplistic classification. That's especially the case when you try to identify if a student is at risk of failing or not. But in the end, you just end up with knowing this. Is this student likely to drop out or not? It's only a binary uh, logic, actually. Whereas you actually want to know why is this student failing? You want to personalize education. And AI does not provide you this information usually. And the third one is monitoring students' faces that can be used to, che to uh, check if you are cheating, if students are cheating in an exam or to assess their attention. Um, not only is this a breach of privacy, if you do not ask students whether they agree with this, but there are also issues of bias and that it could completely not work for students with disabilities if they have, for instance, unusual uh, facial features. Then the facial recognition system will not recognize the face of a student, for instance. Or it could be flagging all the time someone because this person is entitled to have a personal assistant during an exam and then will all the time saying, well, this student may be cheating and then they are more under surveillance than others. And finally, what I notice is that um, educational technologies is usually to aid uh, lecturers rather than students. Even when it could be more for students, they are not really involved. They do not have the power. They are not the one taking decisions, even though some did in the literature. And I think it's problematic because you need to enable students more than control them. So let's wrap it up. Um, so there are definitely advantages to using AI for inclusion. It can uh, definitely reduce some barriers. It can uh, enable education to be more flexible and to uh, fulfill this multi-sensory principle so that you have more than two senses when you teach and study. Um, it can save time, which is a potential to spend more time on meaningful discussion, which is very important to, for inclusion. But at the same time, we need to be cautious because apparently there's a lack of pedagogical and ethical perspective in the literature. And especially if you think about it, because I look into literature, but we know big companies are doing this. And it's also questionable whether they really account for this, even though they have teams for that. Um, but in the end, they also want to make money. Um, and we notice also that uh, the perspective of students with disability is missing, whereas if we want to... to, to to foster inclusion, we need to bring them to the table. We need to learn what they need because they are the ones who have this, this expertise. And there are several issues regarding uh, inclusivity, bias, error, privacy, and expectation settings. So what can we do now? Um, of course, I don't have the perfect solution. It cannot be solved just like this. But there are some um, starting points that I would like to provide to you. Um, so first, I would encourage you to uh, involve students with disability, both in design and evaluation. Do not just wait for them um, at the end of the design process, right? Um, it also means, so if you're a developer, then it's in the design process. But if you are in higher education and you want to buy new products, maybe try to think first about has assistive technologies and try to think how can we enable students and really to, instead of controlling them. This is also something that we talked about this morning and I actually thought, oh, that's good because then I'm not the only one thinking this. Um, 
Also, I would invite you to follow universal design principles and basically really always consider, could that be that this person does not have this ability? And if so, what can we do? And you will see that when you do this, it can actually strive um, innovation because many uh, technologies, for instance, voice assistants, were first thought for uh, people with disabilities who really need them. And then you realize that it can actually help everyone. Just like, for instance, for captioning, it helps more than students with hearing impairment. Um, third, I would like to encourage you to always acknowledge ethical concerns. If you are a developer or researchers, if you're writing an article, I would invite you to talk about what you did to, um, to address the ethical concerns. They are there. And then it means for people who want to develop further, then they will think, okay, how can I cope with this issue? Or maybe you, it's just a reminder for everyone. There are ethical concerns, we need to address them. It shouldn't block you to, to write, but it's still something that needs to be addressed. And if you're a buyer, then you should try to favor those that seems to be committed to this goal. And finally, my last message is that Technology is not always the solution. Sometimes you actually need to be open-minded because what you notice is that sometimes you have many tools and then you will try to put it on students and say, well, this is the tool, this is what you need. But actually sometimes you need to listen to people because they know themselves better than you do and they will be able to tell you, oh, but I would actually prefer to have this. And then by listening to this person, then you can actually strive inclusion. And that's why you really need a holistic uh, vision and try to see how technology is really enabling humans rather than control them. Thank you. On point. <laughs> on point, Orian. You get a lot of, or you got a lot of hearts, uh, like bubbles on the web. Um, there are no questions so far digitally. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Uh, so long, I might start. I must confess, I don't have so much experiences in this field to, to derive any questions from. But I have a question, because I'm sometimes cons uh, working for consultant, consultancy companies that very much address the topic of mental health in the diversity context for the employees. So do you think that the general talk about diversity and inclusion, that everybody's different, brings something for the people who really feel that ha they have a kind of disability in whatever contexts? So is there a movement talking about societies that you think that is backing up what you are fighting for or not? Or is it still a very hard road? Um, <laughs> I will try to stay optimistic. I think, um, let me think. I think there's still an issue of um, a bit like uh, greenwashing, you know, when you try to show, ah, oh, you know, we're doing all this and seeing it like as a charity. Um, I think it, you need to be careful, you need to want it and to really work with the people because I think this is how you actually manage to, to bring accessibility forward. Um, yeah, I think that would be my answer. But, but I, I, I try to imagine that often, if I have the feeling that I have a disability in something, there's the question of shame, etc. And then I think maybe if we have developers, etc., and they, they have their own challenges, let's, let, let's say, if they could put it uh, into the bowl to say that I have a problem with ABC, and then I can really work on it for the better good of everybody. Do you think we, we need more of these people that they confess that they are slower in this? Or, you know what I mean? So is it... Uh, yeah. yeah, I agree. I think um, it needs to be more visible, of course, for the ones who want to. Uh, but I think it's good when, when people recognize their own limits. And I think when, you know, like many people strive, try to... Uh, hire more people who are more diverse, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, recently I read a book on uh, bias from Jessica Nora. And the thing is, when you hire people, it's good, but you really need to change your mindset and to, in, in companies to think, yeah. I want to have this person because this person knows something I don't know. And if she's the only one or they are the only one saying different, then maybe you should question. Maybe this person is saying differently because they have a different perspective and doubt yourself why you disagree with this person. 
I think this is how you can actually... So the first step is to hire them and to um, uh, get in contact with them, but then also really listen to them. I sometimes ask myself, uh, there's a saying that a city for children, that is built for children, is better for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this uh, referred to the AI topic. Is I ask myself if we really consider uh, uh, the people with their different needs carefully, wouldn't that be better for everybody? You know what I mean? Like for the whole working atmosphere, the Achtsamkeit, there's this saying uh, in German, I don't know the word mm -hmm. in English. So, so what, do, don't you believe that if we take this more seriously, this adds something also to the working culture, not only to the people with disabilities, but like to the connection, to the community spirit, to the, like everybody to his or her needs. Do you believe in that? I actually do. Actually, that's connected to universal design principles. One of the principles is to say yeah. it needs to be simple and intuitive in use. So I guess this is what yeah. it goes, right, with uh, yeah. children. And I think if anyone can use it, then people are not so scared about using it. And then you do not assume someone can do that to be able to use it. So, yeah, I think. I have another question waiting for your question. Um, Uh, when my kids have been small in, in, in uh, uh, starting school, there were a lot of parents very concerned about dyslexia with their children. Mine, coincidentally, didn't have it, but it was terrible. So every single uh, test was a horror for the kids and for the parents. So I imagine Kai, AI could be a very powerful tool to identify these disabilities and say, okay, we take it out of the game because this is not a bad learning. It's just the problem of the person. So couldn't we use AI very specifically for specific hindrings? Do you know, in testing, etc. I think this could be a wonderful step towards the future. Yes, I agree, um, especially because I think actually for dyslexia, you know, if you have dyslexia, then you are put into that category. But yeah. actually everybody has some competences that are better or, or worse, right? Mm -hmm. And I think if, we, if there are some competences that are not so important anymore, like being able to write correctly, honestly, everybody is writing, or like not everybody, but most work now is very digital, right? We write emails, we write mm. on our phones, and it already mm. accounts for this. So maybe we should start stopping about worrying about this, um, this form and concentrate on the content. Because in the end, what we want to know is what, what people think and what they have to say, and maybe we should stop mm -hmm. worrying about the form in the mm -hmm. case of dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Any, if there's no more questions so far, you have a question. Yeah, yeah, there's one coming in. Please, now we want to hear your voice. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> uh, so there's one question from the chat. What would AI do that a human could not? Um, and what would you want the process to be less humanized? What? No, and would, would? You, would you want the process to be less humanized? Oh, that's a very general one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what could AI do and humans could not? Uh, I think an AI could um, provide feedback 24-7, right? Um, so, for instance, if, if you need some support, um, let, I have a good example, maybe. So, for instance, there's uh, Be My Eyes, which is an application to help uh, people with uh, visual impairment to reach a volunteer, and then with your phone and your camera, a smartphone, then the person, the volunteer can describe what the person is showing. So let's say there's an obstacle mm -hmm. in the road, then they can see it. And what they're trying to do is uh, with OpenAI, they are trying to make a virtual assistant. And with um, ChatGPT, or GPT-4 actually, uh, you can also have this feedback, right? Asking further questions. And I think what this virtual assistant can do, what a human cannot do, is be always ready, always mm. there. And I think um, I cannot really talk for them, but usually um, what people want is to be independent. So it's true that if you can reach someone anytime from anywhere, then it's actually um, an added value. But then the question is, do you miss maybe talking to someone? Was it worth it? Because some people would say, well, but I prefer with someone because then it's nicer and then people say, oh, I'm happy to have helped you, have a nice day, mm -hmm. and then you really have a, an interaction. But some people would be maybe shyer and they just don't want to talk to someone at, at that point. Or maybe it's something more private and they just don't want to talk to someone 
to let them know, is it the right tampons that I chose or is it something completely different? And that's, that's what I could assume. Can I ask you, as, as a final question, can I ask you a, an ethical question talking about dementia? I would like to know from you, talking about elderly people, for example, we have these cats and they are reacting. So, so from a medical point of view, it might be good for a patient to have this interaction, but it's not human. How do you... It goes beyond uh, the topic we are talking here, but do you, how do you judge this? How do you see this from an ethical, because you have a lot of ethical questions, and fair, and, 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 and yeah, so, 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 so how do you judge that? Um. <laughs> Replacing humans by AI, yeah. I think we, so where I would be more careful, I think uh, human contact is quite important, uh, especially, actually, for anybody. Um, and to be careful that this service is not just given to people who have less money or maybe in the countryside where there are less, um, less medical centers. So I think those are the concerns that I have. But if it's complementary and if it's um, because people, again, cannot be there all the time. And I've seen there's a, a robot that's a seal. It looks very cute. And apparently there are some good um, results. So, I mean... If it shows its effect, then I do not see why not. If, again, considering the, the limits, but if it's complementary, mm -hmm. people like it, it works. People are not deceived also, because then mm -hmm. you need to be clear what it means, but if people like it, yeah. Oriane, thank you so very much. Thank you very much for listening. Oriane. Thank you. Yes. Um, I wanted to thank, for the first time, I think, in these two days, I wanted to thank our wonderful team behind the scenes. Normally, you do this at the end of the day, so I don't know who will stay until uh, 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 5 hours 30. So, big thanks to everybody behind the scenes. I don't name them in person. To every girl and every guy who's like, make it running, bringing this back to life, helping us at the laptops. So, so whatever. Big, big applause, please. Also, digitally, with your bubbles, for the great team behind... Um, there are ve no hierarchies here, and I really love this kind of work. This is also like walking the talk, and I really, you don't know who has what on, on the business card, so this is uh, wonderful in this context. We have 13 and a half minutes pause now. We restart at 14.25 with one of the big shots in the field. Wir gehen dann zurück an den Heilbronner Bildungscampus. Wir haben schon seit gestern mehrfach den Begriff TUM. München, also TUM verwendet. Und wenn ich jetzt sage Helmut Kritschmer, dann wird es so sein, dass viele sagen, ja, den kennen wir. Und der kommt gleich und hält einen Lightning Talk von zehn Minuten. Freue ich mich sehr drauf, die Bühne an ihn abzugeben. Tun wir aber erst in 13 Minuten. Bis gleich. <lacht>